On behalf of all your clergy, Rabbi Adam Stock Spilker, Rabbi Heather Renetsky, Cantor Jennifer Strauss Klein, Cantor Rachel Stock Spilker, and myself, Rabbi Esther Machzor, feel free to dwell there. You can catch up with us when you're ready. We'll announce many page numbers as we go, but if we don't announce a page number, you'll find us on the next white page. Among the many treasures in this machzor are pages with no words and instead an evocative image. I invite you to turn now to the page after 127, after 127, which introduces our morning service. Take a few calming breaths, healing breaths, and spend a moment taking in that image in preparation for prayer. Page 135. Together, we stand this day, all of us, in the presence of our God, youth and elders, women and men, those close to tradition and those who have been estranged, all are welcome in this community of prayer. Around the world, all Israel greets this holy day. We stand with them, a people united by our history and fate, linked in mind and heart to generations past, who stood before God to be cleansed of their sins in Russia, Poland, Germany, and Spain, in Morocco, Egypt, Brazil, and India, our great-grandparents are here with us today, and our great-great-grandchildren as well. All are present in memory and hope. We stand this sacred morning, all of us, as one. Page 138.
at the bottom of page 139. When I sort through the layered texture of what clutters and claims my spirit, I find you, deepest God, in deepest good in residence. You shine like a piece of gold inside of me. In that tranquil, secluded district of the soul, I discover my true, unblemished nature. Teach me that there is much more to me than just my struggle and my failure. Absorb me in the jewel of your love until I am fully one with your goodness. Page 142. For those who study Torah, his brothers took Joseph and cast him into the pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. Why does the verse tell us that there was no water? If the pit was empty, is that not obvious? It means that there was no water, but there were snakes and scorpions within. Our sages teach water represents Torah, source of our life and sustenance. When the mind is empty of Torah, snakes and scorpions will enter. Fill your mind with wisdom, with moral values and teachings. You will have no room for what is vulgar, trivial, or unworthy. And so it is written, those who love your Torah find peace. Guided by your words, they will not stumble. Together, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav v'tivanu l'asok b'divrei Torah. We turn to a reading of Torah on page 149. From Exodus 14. And Adonai passed before him and proclaimed, Adonai, Adonai, God, compassionate, gracious, endlessly patient, loving, and true. Let me just pause for a moment before I continue. What we just did was say the blessing for Torah, and now we are hearing Torah. We just heard a verse from Torah, but Torah is not just the five books. It is the 2,000 years of commentary. Here's what Midrash Pirkei the Rabbi Eliezer did. When the Holy One, blessed be God, had passed by, God removed the hollow of the divine hand from Moses, and he saw the traces of the divine presence. As scripture says, and I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. From Exodus, what we just read. Moses began to cry with a loud voice, and he said, Adonai, Adonai, God compassionate and gracious. So that's the Midrash from 2,000 years ago. Here's a modern way of making that make sense to us. An alternative reading of the biblical text is offered by the Midrash in chapter 47 of Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. It is breathtaking in its boldness. It was not God who revealed these attributes to Moses, but rather Moses who revealed them to God. At first, this notion seems incredible. How is it possible that a mortal might reveal to God an aspect of God's own being? And yet, throughout the tale, it is Moses who is the voice of temperance and kindness, standing in stark contrast to God's volatile anger and retributive intent. I would only add, and furthermore, all understanding of God is human. It is our language. It comes from us. We turn with that sense of what that feels like to page 170. Yes, we are flying through the morning service out of a sense of compassion to you. <laughs> Hallelujah, sing with us.
Page 172. Together from Egypt you redeemed us, Adonai our God, and from a world of slavery you saved us. In times of hunger you fed us, in times of plenty you nourished us. You turned our blight to blessing, spared us from suffering, and rescued us from the sword. Your mercy supports us, and your love abides. Now as in the past, never forsake us. Adonai our God, never turn away. Ha'el b'tamotzot uzecha, ha'gadol b'ichvod shemecha, hano gibor v'no netzach, v'hano ra v'no techa. Together, Holy One, infinite your power, radiant your glory, unbounded your might, awe-inspiring your works. Yishtabach Shimcha La'ad Malkenu, together our sovereign God, source of holiness and greatness. May your name be praised forever in this world and beyond. Eternal One, God of our mothers and our fathers, your strength, <laughs> sanctity, glory, and dominion are deserving of song, praise, poetry, hymn, sacred chant, and blessings of thankfulness for all time and eternity. Blessed are you, Adonai, sovereign of praise, source of the impulse to give thanks, crown of wonders, who desires a world filled with song and a universe of life. <laughs> Amen. 
Page 178, please rise as you're able for Baruch Hu. Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hapoteach Lanu Sha'are Rachamim Umeir Ene Hamechakim Leslichato Yotzer Or Uvore Hoshech Ose Shalom Uvore Takol Or Olam Botzar Chaim Orot Meofel Amar Vayehi Page 180 In love you bring light to the earth and its creatures. Your goodness renews the creation each day. Infinite, varied, and rich are your works, divine artist, all of them wrought with wisdom. The whole earth is teeming with life, awestruck by the universe, work of your hands. Let all life bless you, praise you, and celebrate the beauty of your lights. Or chadash al tzion ta'ir, Kulanu Meherala Oro, may you shine a new light on Zion, and may we soon be privileged to share in that light. Baruch Ata Adonai, Yotzer Hameorot. Together on page 182. Love abundant, love unstinting, our God, you have enfolded us in love. Tender compassion beyond all bounds, your precious gift. Our fathers and mothers gave you their trust, and you gave them Torah, laws by which to live. For their sake, teach us as well. Grace us with your guidance. Loving Father, merciful Mother of us all, grant us clear understanding that we may listen, learn, and teach Preserve, practice, and fulfill with love every lesson of your Torah. May learning your Torah light up our eyes. May our hearts embrace your mitzvot. Page 185. Hineni, behold, I stand ready to listen and learn, to embrace in thought and deed, to proclaim with a whole heart the sacred unity of all being.
be seated. Together, true and steadfast is this teaching, beloved and treasured, a source of wonder, a fount of goodness, a thing of beauty and ours for all time. And true it is, the eternal God is our sovereign, the rock of Jacob, our protecting shield. Through all generations, God's name lives on, God's throne stands firm, God's dominion prevails, God's grandeur and faithfulness endure through eternity. God's words are precious. They will live forever. Together from Egypt, you redeemed us, Adonai, our God. And from the slave house, you set us free. For this, the people who felt your love exalted you, and the ones you found precious sang hymns of praise, blessing, and thanks to the living God who reigns forever, high and exalted, inspiring wonder, who humbles the proud, raises the lowly, who frees the captive, redeems the oppressed, and sustains the poor. God responds to the cry of our people, their prayer in time of need. Sing praise to God most high, most blessed source of blessing. In Moses, Miriam, and all Israel, sang this joyous song to you.
page 198, Hat Filah, standing before God. In the depths of night by the edge of the river, Jacob was left alone. In heartfelt longing in the temple of God, Hannah uttered her prayer alone. In the barren wilderness, in doubt and despair, Elijah found God alone. On the holiest day in the Holy of Holies, the high priest entered alone. We are bound to one another in myriad ways, but each soul needs time to itself. In solitude, we meet the solitary one. Silence makes space for the still, small voice. For the psalmist says, deep calls unto deep. From the depths of our soul, we seek what is most profound. Adonai sevetai tiftach, ufi agi tehilatecha. Adonai, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. Please rise, page 200. Baruch
This is the moment we come to the Unitana Tokaf. The point of the prayer in this moment is to acknowledge our mortality, to recognize the reality we do not know when we will die. There have been many rewritings of this prayer in the past year, some very challenging, thinking about what happened in Israel, thinking about what's happening to our climates. There are so many ways to reinterpret this prayer as Leonard Cohen does on page 609-207. You can see his words there, and many have followed to find other ways to talk about death. But the reality is, with that awareness, the focus is not on why death happens, but rather how to take our own wild and precious life and live it conscious of our behaviors to make our life worthwhile to ourselves and to others. On page 208. Our sovereign God of pardon and forgiveness, let these words of sanctity ascend to you. proclaim this power of this day, a day whose holiness awakens deepest awe and inspires highest praise for your dominion. For your throne is a throne of love, your reign is a reign of truth. In truth you are judge and plaintiff, counselor and witness. You inscribe and seal, you record and recount, you remember all that we have forgotten. And when you open up the book of memories, it speaks for itself, for every human hand leaves its mark, an imprint like no other. Together, and so, a great shofar will cry, tikiyah, a still, small voice will be heard. Angels in a world of fear and trembling will say, behold the day of judgment, for they too are judged. In your eyes, even they are not blameless. All who come into the world pass before you like sheep before their shepherd, as a shepherd considers the flock when it passes beneath the staff. You count and consider every life. You set bounds, you decide destiny, you inscribe judgments.
page 213. The power of this day. An empty page, an open book, a day of ultimate questions. Will I still be here next year at this time with the ones I love beside me? What is in store for my family and what will become of my friends? Who will have reason to celebrate? Who will contend with grief? New love, new babies, marriages, deepening or breaking apart, prosperity, struggle, reversals of fortune, illness and health await us. Who will be missing when we gather next? Who will stand apart? Who will be estranged? And who will have joined us, enriching our community? On the edge of the unknown, we tremble. What lies ahead for us all? An empty page, an open book. Nothing is written and nothing is sealed. Flesh and blood, frail creatures, our lives are fleeting and subject to chance. Yet this we possess, the strength to persist, to prevail, to comfort one another in the dark. Prayer, right action, a turning toward the good, these give us hope and help us bear the pain of life. Page 216. We who are mortal, our origin is dust and so is our end. We wear out our lives to get our bread, like broken vessels, like withered grass, like a flower that must fade, a shadow moving on, a cloud passing by, mere dust on the wind, a dream that flies away. But for you, ever-living sovereign, time has no limits. Your presence, unbounded by days and years, is everywhere, a glorious mystery none can decipher. Your name is worthy of you, and you are worthy of your name. And our name you have linked with yours. Please rise. <laughs> Oh. 
continue now at your own pace, exploring the prayers and poetry through page 250, as well as the meditations of your heart, taking your seats whenever you wish.
On page 252, we rise for Avina Malkenu. We read together, Avinu Malkenu, almighty and merciful, hear our voice. Avinu Malkenu, we have strayed and sinned before you. Avinu Malkenu, have compassion on us and on our families. Avinu Malkenu, halt the onslaught of sickness, violence, and hunger. Avinu Malkenu, halt the reign of those who cause pain and terror. Avinu Malkenu, enter our names in the book of lives well lived. Avinu Malkenu, renew for us a year of goodness. Avinu Malkenu, let our hands overflow with your blessings. Avinu Malkenu, let our eyes behold the dawn of redemption. Avinu Malkenu, we pray, do not turn us away from you with nothing. Avinu Malkenu, Welcome our prayer with love, accept and embrace it. Avinu Malkenu, act towards us as befits your name. Avinu Malkenu, act for your sake, if not for ours. Avinu Malkenu, you alone are our sovereign. Avinu Malkenu, let the gates of heaven be open to our prayer. Avinu Malkenu, hear our voice. Treat us with tender compassion. Avinu Malkenu, almighty and merciful. Answer us with grace, for our deeds are wanting. Save us through acts of justice and love.
page 254, Kriyat HaTorah, reading of the Torah. Let the reading of Torah be like prayer, a meditation to remind us what we strive for, a chant that binds us to the chain of generations. Let the reading of Torah be like prayer, a moment of purest solidarity with our people's hopes and history, an invitation to affirm or dissent, to challenge or believe, to ask why or say amen. Let the reading of Torah be like prayer, flowing like waters that renew the spirit, refreshing and sweet to nourish the soul. Let the reading of Torah be like prayer, every word a blessing, every word a conversation with God. Together, Adonai, Adonai, God compassionate, gracious, endlessly patient, loving and true, showing mercy to the thousandth generation, forgiving evil, defiance and wrongdoing, granting pardon. Oh, <laughs> 
We are now returning to the last speech of Moses to the Israelite people, his last will and testament. What is his message? To find out, please take advantage of the illuminating commentaries that our prayer book provides on page 265, for instance. And then ask yourself, what does choose life, this phrase we say every year, what does it mean? What does it mean to you this year? Our Torah reading will be on page 266 following. If you are online looking at a Torah, we are in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 9. Our Balai Kori chanting Torah will be Betsy Rest. For the Aliyah, we invite Elise, accompanied by Peter Cole. We honor them as they are among our more than 100 new member households over the past couple years. What is especially sweet about this Aliyah is that Elise grew up at Mount Zion. I was her sporty youth group advisor back in the day. Her parents both were deeply involved with our remodeling and our arts and our decor. Peter and Elise were married here, and they now have returned. Welcome back. Tamod behira bat David behira aliyah harishona. Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamavarach. Baruch Adonai Hamavarach leolam Baruch Adonai Hamvrach Leolam Vaed, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam, Asher Bachar Banu Miko Haamim, Vinatan Lanu et Torato, Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah. Amen. Amen. Atem nitzavim hayom kulchem lifnei Adonai Eloheichem rasheichem shivteichem zikneichem v'shodrechem kol ish Yisrael tapachem nesheichem v'gerecha asher bekerav machanecha Bichotev etzecha, ad shoev meimecha, lavracha, bivrit, Adonai Elohecha uvalato, asher Adonai Elohecha, koret imcha hayom, lamaan, hakim autcha hayom lo, Lam, vehu yehie lecha lalohim, ka asher diber lach, ve ka asher nishba la avotecha, la avraham la yitzak, ulya akov, velo idechem levadchem, anochi, korate et habrit hazot, ve et ha Allah. Hazot ki et asher yashno po imanu omein hayom lifne Adonai Eloheinu ve et asher anenu po imanu hayom. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu torat emet, v'chaye olam nata bitochinu, Baruch atah Adonai, noten ha-torah. Amen. And Elise and Peter, if you'll look this way, I'd like to invite anyone else who is um, someone who joined Mount Sinai this past year to stand at your place if you happen to be here. And we offer to you, all new members, this Mishaberach, 
May God, who blessed our ancestors, bless all who have chosen to support and join a synagogue, the oldest institution of Jewish life, the one that primarily preserves community, transmitting our culture, values, and religion, Lador Vador, from generation to generation. May the Holy Blessed One inspire all who have joined us in the pursuit of Torah, Avadah, and Gimilut Chasadim, lifelong learning, worship, and acts of loving kindness and justice. Amen. Amen. As we heard last night, the Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kotsk says, there is nothing more whole than a broken heart. Some of us may be here with broken hearts, broken spirits, maybe even feeling like we have broken bodies or broken emotions. All of us, whether we are in pain or feeling pretty good, are praying for wholeness, for shleimut, for wholeness of brokenness and for wholeness of wholeness and for wholeness of our whole world. We're going to continue now with verse 11 on page 267. For our second aliyah, our Baal Kore will be Bob Mast, and we honor John Strauss, Mount Zion's president-elect, for leading a task force last year to create Mount Zion's ethics code. When the Union for Reform Judaism instructed us, along with all congregations, to adopt a code, they gave us a template. This should be easy, just agree to what they suggested. Yeah, right, that's not the Mount Zion way. Four lawyers, one ethicist, and two good troublemakers later, we had a process that was extensive, helped us truly anchor what we expected of all versus what we required of all, anchored in our Jewish values and our Mount Zion mission, John led us with clarity through it all. It is clear the ethics code will guide us as well in the years to come. All information about the ethics code is on our website under abouts, under the board. Ya'amod Yonatan ben Eliyahu vedina la'aliyah ha'shenit. Barhu Adonai hamvarach. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Le'olam Ba'ed Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Le'olam Ba'ed Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam Asher Bar Harbanu Mikal Ha'amim V'natan Lanu Et Torah To Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen Amen. Ki ha mitzvah hazot asher anochi mitzavecha hayom lo niflet hi mimecha velo rechoka hi lo vashamayim hi lemor mi yalelanu hashamayma Vikahalanu, Vyashmienu Ota, Vena Asena. Velo me ever la yam he le mor. Mia avar lanu, el ever ha yam, Vikahalanu, Vyashmienu Ota, Vena Asena. Kikaro velecha. Hadavar meod, befil hau vil vav la soto. Rai natati lefanacha hayom, et hachayim vetatov, vetamavet vetara, asher anohi metzaveha hayom, lahava. Et Adonai Elohecha lalechet bidrachav velishmor mitzvotav v'hukotav u'mishpatav v'hayita v'ravita u'rachecha Adonai Elohecha ba'aretz asher atav Lerisham. 
Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu Malach Alam Asher Natan Lanu Torah Emet Vehaye Olam Nata Betochenu Baruch ata Adonai Noten Ha Torah Amen. I'd like to invite all who are part of our Ethics Code Task Force who are here to also stand with our appreciation. Mishaberach Havatena Vimotenu, may the Holy One honor John and all who serve to articulate our ethics expectations and requirements. May they experience blessings commensurate to the blessings they selflessly offered others, the blessings of health, protection, success, shalom, shayachut, tzedek, v'simcha. On this Yom Kippurim, seal them for lives of goodness and lives well lived, and may we say, Amen. We continue with verse 17, our Baal Kore's Dave Knapp, and for the Aliyah, Rebecca Jacob, who was among our 20-plus group from the St. Paul Jewish community who traveled to Israel last March in the midst of pain, resilience, heartache, community, heroism, tragedy, creativity, and so much more. We chose Rebecca as a representative not only for being able to articulate so well on our trip why we did what we did, but because in your short time at Mount Zion, you've showed up for so much, leading daily services, participating in programming, baking for Onegs, and much more. We are grateful for all you bring to Mount Zion. Ta'amu devora badavaram vitsara la'aliyaha shlishi. Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamvorach. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach le'olam v'ahed. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach le'olam v'ahed. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Asher bachar banu mikol ha'amim. V'natan lanu et Torato. Baruch Ata Adonai noten ha'Torah. Amen. Amen. Ve'im ifnei levavcha ve'lo tishma ve'nidachta ve'hishtachavita l'elohim acherim ve'avadam higarati lachem hayom ki avod tovedun lo ta'arichun yamim al harachma asher ata over et hayardain levo shama lerishta haidoti vachem hayom et hashemaim ve'et ha'aretz hachayim ve'hamavet natati levenecha Habracha ve haklala, uva harti ve chayim, le mantihie ata ve zarecha, le hava et arona elohecha, lishmo bekolo udavka bo, ki hu chayecha ve orech yamecha, la shevet al hadama. Asher nishpa Adonai la'avotecha la'avraham li'itzchak ul'yaakov la'tet lahem. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam Asher natan lanu Torah temet v'chaye olam nata betochenu baruch ata Adonai noten ha Torah. Amen. I'd like to ask all who went on our Federation trip, who are here to stand, as well as anyone who went to Israel in this past year, including Michael Chow's, Rob Levowitz, Jessica Ostrov, and Rebecca Pravarchuk, who volunteered extensively. May God, who bless all of our ancestors, bless you, Rebecca, and all who have traveled to Israel. In this sacred moment, give us hope for Israel and her future. Renew our wonder at the miracle of the Jewish state. In the name of the pioneers who made the deserts bloom, give us the tools to cultivate a diversity of Jewish expression in Israel. 
In the name of fallen soldiers, give us courage to stand up to the words and ways of zealots, those in our midst and those amongst our neighbors. In the name of Israeli inventors who have amazed the world with their innovations, help us apply the same ingenuity to finding a path to peace. In the name of all these women and men, give us the strength to conquer doubt and despair in Israel, replacing doubt with action, replacing despair with hope, and let us say, Amen. Amen. We all rise now as we lift and dress the Torah, the Amod, Amag Biha. of this holy day, we allow a voice of protest to rattle us. This voice belongs to one of the most brilliant people in our history. He transformed Judaism in the 6th century BCE, same time that Confucius was teaching in China, Aristotle in Greece, or Aster in Persia. Isaiah was more than a prophet, he was a revolutionary thinker. He was not afraid to confront groupthink or hypocrisy. When he says, is this the fast that I desire, he was not being rhetorical. He was really demanding that we let the oppressed go free, feed the hungry, treat our workers fairly. Prophetic imagination comes, according to Walter Brueggemann, at the intersection of two elements, criticality and hope. Criticality is a clear view of the world's pain, limits, and needs, and hope is a sense of its promise and possibility. And that is why we honor prophetic imagination so highly in the reform movements. We know that we live at the intersection of criticality and hope. Eric Lund will chant now from Isaiah chapter 58. You can follow along, page 277. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Bachar Binavim Tovim Veratsa Vadivrahem Hanemarim Behemet Baruch Ata Adonai Habocher Batora, Uv Moshe Avdo, Uv Yisrael Amo, Uv Invie Haemet, Vat Sedek. Kera Vegaron, Al Tachsoch, Kashofar Harem Kolecha. Vehagid le ami pish am ulavet yakov chatotam veoti yom yom yidroshun vedat derachai yechpatsun kegoi 
אשר צדקה עשה, ומשפט אלוהיו לא עזב. ישאלוני משפטי צדק, קרבת אלוהים יחפצון. למה צמנו ולא ראית? הנינו נפשנו ולא תדע. הן ביום צומכם תמצאו חפץ וכל עצביכם תנגוסו. הן לריב ומצא תעצומו ולהכות באגרוף רשע. לא תצומו חיום להשמיע במרום קולכם. החזה יהיה צום אבחרהו יום ענות אדם נפשו הלכוף כאגמון ראשו ושק ואפר יציע הלזה תקרא צום ויום רצון לאדוני הלא זה צום אבקרהו פתח הצובות רשע התר אגודות מותר ושלח רצוצים חופשים וכל מותר תינתקו הלא פרוס לרעב לחמך ועניים מרודים תביבית כי תראה ערום וכיסיתו ומבשרך לא תתעלם אז יבקע כשחר אורך וארוחתך מהרה תצמח והלך לפניך צדקך כבוד אדוני יאספך. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם צור כל העולמים צדיק בכל הדורות האל הנאמן, האומר ועושה, המדבר ומקיים, שכל דבריו אמת וצדק. על התורה ועל העבודה ועל הנביאים ועל יום השבת הזה ועל יום הכיפורים הזה שנתת לנו, אדוני אלוהינו למחילה ולסליחה, נו, לקדושה ולמנוחה, למחילה ולסליחה, ולכפרה לכבוד ולתפארת. על הכל, אדוני אלוהינו, אנחנו מודים לך ומברכים אותך. יתברך שמך בפי כל חי תמיד לעולם ועד. ודברך אמת וקיים לעד, ברוך אתה אדוני. מלך מוכר וסולח לעוונותינו ועל עוונות עמו בית ישראל. ומעביר אשמותינו בכל שנה ושנה, מלך על כל הארץ, מקדש השבת וישראל. 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 ויום הכיפורים. Please
please rise. A prayer for our country not in your prayer book. Adapted from Rabbi Joseph A. Sklut. Our God, God of our ancestors and our descendants, we are grateful for our country, the United States of America. May it always be a haven for the oppressed, its neighborhoods and byways peaceful and secure. May the officers of our government be blessed with wisdom and good counsel. May they act in unison to promote the welfare of all, and may petty rivalry be banished from their deliberations. May agriculture and commerce be prosperous. May schools and places of learning flourish so that future generations gain the knowledge of freedom and learn the responsibilities of citizenship. Guard our land from calamity and injury. Plant among the peoples of different nationalities and faiths who dwell here love and understanding, peace and friendship. Spread the shelter of your peace over those who serve our country here and abroad. May it be your will that our land be a force for good for all who live on earth, and that all peoples know its blessings so the vision of your prophet may be fulfilled. Let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. And let us say, Amen. In a prayer for Israel, also not in your prayer book, written by Rindy Azevedo. Guardian of Israel, guard the remnants of your people. Hold the shattered hearts of families who have lost loved ones. Hear the cries of those who lost their homes, their communities, their friends, their sense of safety. Help them rebuild their lives and have the courage to keep living. Give us all stability as we adjust to this new reality, one we so desperately wish we could change. Guardian of Israel, guard the remnants of your people, Israel. Help those still held hostage in Gaza find their inner strength and resilience. Keep them safe. Soothe the ragged voices of those working tirelessly to free them. Give us strength to continue until all of them are home. Guardian of Israel, guard all non-combatants in Gaza, the West Bank and Lebanon, and across the region who want only to live, keep them safe and nourish. Guardian of Israel, guard the remnants of your people, Israel. Fill her leaders and soldiers with wisdom. Give them the audacity to imagine a future where Israel and her neighbors live side by side in lasting, quiet peace. Help us find the paths that lead there and the bravery to believe that it's possible. Guardian of Israel, guard the remnants of all your people, Israel. Soften the hard, angry edges of our hearts. Ease our burdens. Let us sigh with relief. Open our minds and our ears so that we can hear many perspectives. Keep us open to empathy, forgiveness, and trust. May we never be lazy in the work of peace. And together we say, Amen. Amen. We return the Torah now to the ark. Turn now 
to V. Dewey on page 296. Vidui Rabba, Vidui Zata, the short confession. Together, our God and God of all generations, may our prayers reach your presence. And when we turn to you, do not be indifferent. Adonai, we are arrogant and stubborn, claiming to be blameless and free of sin. In truth, we have stumbled and strayed. We have done wrong. Please rise. Together in the English, the ways we have wronged you under duress and by choice, and harm we have caused in your world, consciously and unconsciously. The ways we have wronged you through our thoughtlessness and the harm we have caused in your world through impulsive acts of malice. 
והאחיד שחטאנו לפניך בזלזול הורים ומורים. The ways we have wronged you by abusing our power and harm we have caused in your world through disrespect to parents and teachers. The ways we have wronged you by giving in to our hostile impulses. And harm we have caused in your world through inflexibility and stubbornness. The ways we have wronged you through lies and deceit, and harm we have caused in your world by making light of serious matters. The ways we have wronged you in our routine conversations and the harm we have caused in your world through envy. For all these failures of judgment and will, God of forgiveness, forgive us, pardon us, lead us to atonement. We focused inward, narrowing our vision. We were preoccupied with ourselves. We turned our backs on the poor and defenseless. We were contemptuous of the weak. We tolerated violence against children, neglect of the old, exploitation of the innocent. We told ourselves there was nothing we could do. We wasted the resources of the earth. We denied our own responsibility and put it out of our minds. We kept silent when we should have spoken out. We gave in to cynicism and despair. We sought entertainment instead of enlightenment. We were lazy, indifferent, and callous. We forgave ourselves too easily for our failures. We forgot that we always have a choice. Page 308. Cheshbon and Nefesh, in introspection and silent confession, we are together this day to confess our sins, but these moments are mine. In the privacy of my heart, I acknowledge the wrongs I have done, pain I have given, intentionally and unintentionally. My thoughtlessness, careless, heartless actions, and my failures to do what was right. I reflect on the harm I have done to myself. Take a moment to look through the list and search our souls.
I reflect on the harm I have done to my family and friends. I reflect on the harm I have done to the world around me. I reflect on the harm I have done to the Jewish people. For all this, we confess all of our harms. But we have also done good, and this Moxor provides us to lean in on our good actions. Page 313. Together, let us affirm the good we have done. Let us acknowledge our acts of healing and repair for the good we have done by acting with self-restraint and self-control, for the good we have done through acts of generosity and compassion, for the good we have done by offering children our love and support, for the good we have done by honoring our parents with care and respect, for the good we have done through acts of friendship and hospitality, for the good we have done through acts of forgiveness and reconciliation, for the good we have done by keeping promises and honoring commitments, for the good we have done through the work of our hands and by serving others, for the good we have done by caring for the earth and sustaining its creatures, for the good we have done by housing the homeless, feeding the hungry, and welcoming the stranger, for the good we have done by acting with integrity and honesty, for the good we have done through thoughtful and encouraging words, for the good we have done by caring for our health and that of our loved ones, for the good we have done by strengthening our Jewish community, for the good we have done through acts of civic engagement and tikkun olam. All these have brought light and healing into the world. May these acts inspire us to renew our efforts in the year to come.
You may remember this scene from Fiddler on the Roof. Perchik tells a group of men that they should pay attention to what's happening in the world, and Tevya pronounces, he's right. One of the men retorts, why should I break my head about the outside world? Let the outside world break its own head. Tevya thinks for a moment and thoughtfully says, he's right. A third man wags his finger and says, he's right and he's right. They can't both be right. And Tevya, doling out milk from his cart, answers, you know, you're also right. It's a quintessentially Jewish conversation. Two opposing propositions, which are both right, then a third is thrown in, which is also right. There's a reason why they say, two Jews, three opinions. But in this past year, it seems we've forgotten how this goes. Instead, friendships, families, and communities are breaking apart by the finger-waggers assertion that they can't both be right, by the presumption that for me to be right, you must be wrong. There's a passage in the Talmud that describes the ongoing disputes between the sages Hillel and Shammai over matters of Jewish law. It says, for three years, the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai argued. One said, our opinion is right, and the other said, our opinion is right. A heavenly vo voice broke in. Elu elu divrei Elohim chayim hem. Both these and those are the words of the living God. This is unexpected. Instead of simply declaring who is right, the heavenly voice announces that there is something divine flowing through both camps, even if their conclusions are in opposition. It's a radical thought. The argument of the person we are so quick to dismiss as wrong is nonetheless divinely inspired. And then, in the Talmud text, the law is decided with Hillel. Wait, what? I thought they were both right. The other sages were surprised too. The Talmud text continues. A question was raised. Since the heavenly voice declared both these and those are the words of the living God, why was the law with Hillel? It is because the students of Hillel were kind and gracious. They taught their own ideas as well as the ideas from the students of Shammai. Not only that, but they went so far as to teach Shammai's opinions first. This story teaches that there is value in learning both sides of an argument, even if one will prevail in the end. Sometimes a decision needs to be made, a course laid. Perceiving divinity on all sides doesn't change that. Rabbi Micah Goodman explains that there are two sides to Jewish discourse. There's an intellectual side and a practical side. Intellectually, we are expected to study divergent views because both have value. Practically, we're expected to follow the law. The Jewish expectation then is to have an intellectual world that is wider than the practical world. 
The world we live in pushes us in the opposite direction. Social media algorithms create echo chambers where everything we read supports everything we think, shrinking our intellectual world down to narrow straits of confirmation bias. A peek behind the curtain. After I wrote that sentence, narrow straits of confirmation bias, I was curious about narrow straits, so I went to Google. Here's what it said. A strait is a narrow body of water that connects to larger bodies of water. Straits are often created by a fracture in the land connecting the bodies of water. When the stress between geological plates becomes too great, the plates suddenly slip past each other, causing the brittle ground to crack. Straits can be difficult to navigate and may not be navigable at all. Translate all that science into the language of human interaction around polarizing issues, and it has something to say. A strait is a narrow connection between two individuals. Narrow straits are often created by a fracture in communication. When the stress between ideological positions becomes too great, the people suddenly slip past each other causing the brittle relationship to crack. Straits can be difficult to navigate and may not be navigable at all. King David knew narrow straits. He wrote in Psalm 118 that we sing at every festival, Min hametsar karatiya anani bamerkavya. From a narrow place, I called out to God. God answered me with divine expansiveness. I wonder, can we too respond to narrowness with expansiveness? I think we can. We can navigate the narrow straits of confirmation bias by widening the expanse of our intellectual world and listening for that divine voice saying, Elu Elu, these and those are the words of the living God. These and those both have value. It may be counterintuitive and countercultural, but it is very Jewish for opposing ideas to both have value. Rabbi Simcha Bonham taught that we should always keep two truths in our pockets. In one pocket, I am but dust and ashes. And in the other, for my sake, the world was created. If we were to live our lives by only one of these truths, either one, it isn't hard to imagine that that wouldn't end well. In psychology, the coexistence of opposing truths is called dialectics. We can love someone and hate them. We can be excited about a change and terrified of it. We can grieve the loss of a loved one and be glad that their suffering is over. We can care about the Israelis and the Palestinians. Therapists teach people struggling with dialectic moments to practice self-compassion and accept the opposing but interconnected thoughts. Psychologist Phil Glickman writes that our mental health can be heavily determined by how we accept the dialectics that confront us. And I would suggest our relationships will be heavily determined by how we accept the dialectics between us. Some of us feel that our concern for Palestinians isn't welcome in the Jewish community. Some of us feel that our concern for Israelis isn't welcome anywhere else. Some feel that acknowledging any degree of truth in a different perspective on the Middle East is a betrayal of people and values we hold dear. But it doesn't have to be that way. The world is not a zero-sum game. Reducing issues to binary propositions strips them of all complexity and nuance. Accepting that conflicting perspectives might both be true can be unsettling. 
But if we apply the therapeutic practices to our difficult conversations, and if we proceed with compassion and understanding, I believe we can do it. Remember why Hillel's opinion prevailed over Shammai's? Because Hillel showed honor and kindness to Shammai by hearing him out before presenting his own opinion. In the narrow straits we are trying to navigate at this time, we cannot afford to do otherwise. Because if we are not careful, our narrow straits will quickly become dire straits. One way we can process accepting dialectical truths is by employing a technique they use at improv theater called yes and. Imagine an improv scene about a trip to the zoo on a hot day. First person says, let's go to the zoo. Second one says, yes. And if it gets too hot, we can cool off in the penguin house. Then the next says, yes. And I've been to the penguin house. I love watching those little guys waddle, and so on. In improv, yes and creates an ongoing conversation that develops as the scene progresses. Yes and is a useful tool also in conversation and not an easy one. Essentially, it means replacing the word but with the word and. In real life, the zoo congregate, congregation, the zoo conversation, this is not a zoo congregation. In real life, the zoo conversation might more likely go, let's go to the zoo, but it's too hot. End of conversation. The yes and technique to keep the improv scene going requires creativity, patience, and practice. In real life conversations on issues where we might disagree, a yes and approach requires creativity, patience, and practice, plus humility, curiosity, an expansive mind, and an open heart. But we are not in an improv group. We are in the perilous real world. I will tell you, I am scared. I don't know the end of the story we are slogging through. What will become of American democracy after November? Will the war in the Middle East ever end? If and when it does, what will remain amidst all the devastation, both on the ground and in our souls? Will it tear us apart? How far will anti-Semitism go? Will anywhere be safe for Jews? The uncertainty of this moment leaves me feeling unmoored, adrift. Perhaps you feel it too. Such radical uncertainty about the future can lead us to despair, to lose hope. But I think it's in our nature to fight despair and so we compensate by hanging on desperately to whatever certainties we feel we do have, few as they may be. The desire for certainty is what makes us peek at the end of the book to see if the heroine survives. Certainty grounds us and gives us a sense of moral clarity. But certainty can also make us hold too tightly to narrow perspectives and close ourselves off from other views and the people who hold them. Certainty can quickly become rigidity, and rigid things are more likely to break. The mighty oak can be broken by a strong wind. I can tell you that by the oak in my backyard. But the flexible willow will survive the storm. On Rosh Hashanah, we read Yehuda Amichai's poem, the place where we are right. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a courtyard. But doubts and loves loosen the earth like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where a house once stood, now destroyed. 
The place where we are right doesn't allow for growth. Certainties may make us feel safe, but they can also harden us and prevent the flowering of understanding. Doubt and love may unsettle us, but they create the space for truth and compassion if we can widen our perspectives enough. The High Holy Days are the time to reflect on the hardened and narrow places where we are certain we are right. One of the sins we just recited in the Vidui several times is the sin of Kishui Oref, being stiff-necked. Think about it. When you have a stiff neck, you literally can't turn your head to see anything outside your range of vision. In Exodus, God sees that the Israelites are stiff-necked and wants to destroy them because of it. Rashi interprets that they turn their backs and refuse to listen. And then another commentator adds, such people will reject even what they know to be true if it conflicts with what's good or convenient for themselves. In a book published just last month, sociologist Ilana Redstone calls this kind of resolute unwillingness to consider views other than our own the certainty trap. Caught in the certainty trap, we assume not only that you must be wrong for me to be right, but that there must be some, something wrong with you. Be honest. Have you never wondered what's wrong with all the Americans on the other side of an election? When we are in the certainty trap, says Redstone, we tend to dismiss those who disagree with us as hateful, ignorant, or just plain stupid. The problem is that sometimes those people are our parents or our children, our friends, coworkers, fellow congregants. Then our certainty comes at a very high cost. It can literally destroy the house. I'm pretty sure Alana Redstone is Jewish, but even if she isn't, her concern about certainty is. Because I think Judaism abhors certainty like nature abhors a vacuum. When God calls Abraham to be the patriarch of all future Jews, God tells him, leave everything you know and head out to some undetermined place. When Moses asks for God's name, God answers, I will be what I will be. We are Yisrael, the ones who wrestle. The Unatana Tokef we just recited seems like certainty. On Rosh Hashanah, it is written, and on Yom Kippur, it is sealed. Who shall live and who shall die? But then, wait for it, Teshuva, Tefila, and Sadaka can shift the decree. Emmanuel Rachman wrote, a Jew dare not live with absolute certainty, not only because certainty is the hallmark of the fanatic, but also because doubt is good for the human soul. One way to avoid certainty traps, says Alana Redstone, is to start asking questions and to do so while understanding that the most important thing often isn't answering the questions, but generating them. Abraham Joshua Heschel said, we are closer to God when we are asking questions than we are when we think we have the answers. I have mentored conversion students for over 25 years. Almost without exception, the major appeal Judaism has for them is its openness to questions. There is truth to the old joke that a Jew will always answer a question with another question. Of course, not all questions are the same. Tone matters. Intent matters. Our sages understood this. In the Passover Seder, the wicked child asks a question, but does so scornfully and not out of any genuine interest or curiosity. The wise child asks in order to learn. Tempering our certainty with curiosity is not easy. 
It requires a change in paradigm. We spend our earliest years in school rewarded for producing the right answer and keeping our eyes on our own papers. So it shouldn't surprise us that our natural curiosity dwindles as we age. A typical five-year-old asks 65 questions a day, predominantly beginning with, why? By the age of eight, this drops to 41 questions. And by the time we are adults, we pose a mere six questions each day, primarily centered around when, where, or how much. We begin our educational journey as question marks and graduate as periods. And when it really matters, we become exclamation points. On Rosh Hashanah, Rabbi Spilker taught us the acronym PLANTS for how to effectively respond in difficult conversations. The A in PLANTS stands for ASK. Engage with questions born of genuine curiosity about our opponent's views without hostility or cynicism. It's good advice, and we need to follow it. But it only gets us halfway there. To avoid the certainty trap, we not only need to judge others less, but we need to question ourselves more. In the coming year, I challenge all of us to take curiosity a step further and ask not just about the other person's perspectives, but to question our own positions, motivations, and certainties. I challenge us to avoid the certainty trap and the danger it poses to relationships by pausing and asking ourselves a couple of overarching questions. Ask with genuine curiosity, what is my goal in this conversation? What am I trying to do? Might there be any pertinent information I am missing? And perhaps most importantly, what else is at stake besides the topic at hand? And as we engage with someone in conversation, there are another four questions I think are worth asking ourselves. They come out of the Musar tradition, the trait of shmirat halashon, mindful speech. One, does this need to be said? Two, does it need to be said now? Three, does it need to be said by me? And four, will it be beneficial? Does this need to be said? Does it need to be said now? Does it need to be said by me, and will it be beneficial? I'm not saying that we shouldn't be passionate about our values or take a stand against injustice. Redstone says at the very beginning of her book, avoiding certainty doesn't mean we can't say this is right and this is wrong. It just means we need to understand what is informing our passions, the extent to which our speech can actually make a difference, and as I said, what else is at stake? We can take a stand and still choose to be curious, to ask questions instead of jumping to conclusions. It's so easy to write off people who disagree with us, to post a rant on social media, or fire off a scathing email. But the easy way usually isn't the best way. If we can slow ourselves down, and respond with curiosity rather than react with hostility, we may discover that the connecting straits are wider than we think. If we can expand our intellectual world beyond our immediate one, we may discover that, in fact, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim hem, these and those are the words of the living God. In Psalm 118, King David called for God from the narrow place. Min hametzar karatiya. And God answered, bamer chavya, with divine expansiveness. When we find ourselves constricted by our own narrow mindedness, when our certainties stiffen our necks so that we can't see the past, see past the hardened place where we are right, 
When our positions jeopardize our relationships, anenu, God, bamerchavya, bless us with expansiveness so that instead of being closed, we can be open. Instead of being right, we can be loved. Understanding can flower and whispers can be heard. Can you hear God's own? May it be God's will. Prayer services will continue now throughout this day, which is why there are no concluding prayers, Elena and Kaddish, for the morning service. For those who are online, I encourage you to find ways to stay connected to reflection and prayer throughout this day as well. In person, we encourage you to stay in and around the synagogue, as have stated many each year, find this so meaningful to be here with each other in community. We also have a classroom 105 in our religious school wing if you're interested in a place for reflection or meditation or reading. If about fasting, I want to say that if you are ill or pregnant or nursing or facing an eating disorder, it is not only permitted but a mitzvah to eat on Yom Kippur. If you need a space to take a break or eat because of health reasons, we have room 106 available. 
If this is your last service, we invite you to leave your name tag holder as you leave. Thank you to everyone who brought bags of groceries for Hallie Q. Brown and Neighborhood House this morning. It is so important. And you can continue to bring in food through Sukkot. Our Yom Kippur appeal, it is um, devastating to see the news about the hurricanes. One of the ways to respond as a community is through this Yom Kippur appeal. We encourage you to give generously also through Sukkot which I want to mention, we will have a sukkah here on our patio throughout the holiday. You're welcome to come and enjoy a meal in it, and um, there's information on our website about how to do that. On the last day of Sukkot, on Wednesday, uh, October 23rd, we will have our pizza in the huts, which will lead directly into the final holiday, Simcha Torah, where we will dance with our Torah scrolls. For today, all the services and musical meditations are listed on your Yom Kippur printed card or online at mzion.org. And about 1.45 in about 10 minutes will be a poetry session that I'll lead about poems written since October 7th, which will be in our Harris Chapel. Down, all the way down at the end of the hallway in our library, our Bloom Library, will be a chair yoga session for all ages and all bodies. Come in whatever clothes you are wearing. It will be done in com completely in a chair. Avadab bigashmiyut, body spirituality, a way to feel the messages that we just heard and the work of these holidays in your body. And tonight, after Yisker, and engaging an engaging afternoon service where we will hear from congregants speaking about their connection to our community connected to our vision statement. When you stay or return for the final service and that final tiki of the shofar, watching dozens of children hold candles on this bima, they practiced last Sunday, they look gorgeous. And our havdalah will be led by our guitar corps. It'll be a culmination to a meaningful high holy days after which we will break fast together. As our holy day continues, may you find in it comfort, forgiveness, and a closeness to the Holy Blessed One. Some call, may this be an easy and meaningful fast. This concludes our morning service. <laughs>